we were discussing how by using uh, optimization, in particular least square programs, we can include inequality constraints in our uh, controller. And we saw that we can include a uh, torque limit. So this is basically the, the original inverse dynamics control problem where we have no inequality constraints. And by simply adding these constraints to our optimization problem, we get a controller that is aware that you have limitation in terms of uh, torque at the motors. And similarly, since uh, if you're using electric motors, the, the current that you have at the motor is proportional to the torque, you can also include um, current limit in the same way because even these are linear in the variables of your problem which are the joint torques and the joint accelerations so they don't change basically the the kind of optimization problems that you get because you always have linear inequalities and i showed you also very very quickly last time that you can also include um, joint velocity limits but let me sh show it to you again a bit more carefully because last time it was too quick the idea for including velocity limits is a, is a bit different from the torque limits and the current limits because the torques are a variable of your problem so of course torque limits are linear in the problem variables velocities are not a variable of your problem accelerations are so to include velocity limits we need to express velocities as a function of accelerations in particular as a linear function of accelerations and the way we do that is by assuming that uh, the acceleration is gonna stay constant for one for the time step of the controller which is typically a very good approximation because the time step is very fast and so if you apply constant torque for one millisecond we can approximate the, the resulting acceleration as constant so under this mild assumption we know that the velocity at the next time step is just equal to the current velocity plus delta t times the acceleration and in this way basically we express the, the next velocity as a linear function of the acceleration which is a problem variable okay so with this simple trick we can now include also velocity limits in our controller so starting from the classic inverse dynamics controller which is a very old uh, control algorithm just by rewriting it as a least square program which by itself doesn't give us anything more it's exactly the same controller but then we can start adding all these uh, limits and we get immediately a controller that is much more intelligent in a certain way because is aware of the limitations of the hardware that it's controlling, okay? So we have torque limits, current limits, and joint velocity limits. What about joint position limits? Well, in theory, we could use the same trick that I just showed you for the joint velocities, also for the joint positions, right? Because we can say, okay, uh, assuming that my accelerations are constant for one time step, the position at the next time step is equal well to this expression which everybody knows is just a double integral uh, of a constant acceleration and yes you can do it so you can say you can constrain this function here which is linear in the accelerations which are your variable uh, to stay within the joint limits People have done it for a very long time, but the problem is that it doesn't work very well in practice. Because basically this approach tends to allow you to reach uh, the, the neighborhood of the limit with a very high velocity, and then it asks you to decelerate very, very fast at the last moment. So typically it's going to give you uh, required accelerations that are incompatible with the torque or the current limits 
which is gonna lead to an infeasible problem if you do it in this way. The good news is that this is a very stupid way of doing it and there is a smarter way of doing it but it's a bit convoluted to explain so I'm not gonna explain it to you in this class I've added uh, three references in case you're interested in this problem or we can talk about it offline if you want it's not so complicated but it would take me maybe half an hour and I think it's better to spend the little time we have on other more, more general things okay just be aware that there are ways of including also joint position limits we are just gonna we are not gonna focus on that in this course okay so let's try to summarize what we have seen in this set of slides we have seen the inverse dynamics control law for basically tracking a reference joint trajectory so in joint space which is this we have seen that there is there are other uh, uh, simpler control laws this one is also called very often inverse dynamics control you just basically remove the parentheses so that the, the pd terms are not multiplied by the mass matrix and then you have pd plus gravity compensation and you have pid control so you can see these four control laws basically as um, each each new row is a simplified version of the previous row right because you're, you're using less and less the, the model of the system. For instance, when you go from, from here to here, you stop using the mass matrix and the Coriolis and centrifugal forces, you just use gravity. Then when you move from here to here, you, you use no model at all. It's just PID, you don't even have the gravity model. So as I said last time, you can expect this to be worse than this, which should be worse than this, which should be worse than this. Because this is exactly feedback linearizing the system, so it should give you the best performance ever. You're making your system linear and then you do whatever you want with that, because it's the simplest system you can hope to, to control. Uh, in practice, however, the more you use of your model, the less robust your, your controller is, because if your model is wrong, then you may have stability issues and all of them are, are stable so since this is stable and doesn't require any model it's going to be for sure the more the most <coughs> robust and then basically we have decided to to focus on, on this one because that's uh, the subject of this week inverse dynamics control and we have seen that you can rewrite this as an optimization problem why not? And thanks to that, we can add uh, inequality constraints to the problem, torque limits, current limits, joint velocity limits. Okay. These are the references. Uh, you can find them in the slides. And now what I would like to do is to uh, start basically already getting familiar with the code. Um, before you, you start running your virtual machine and executing this, the exercises, I'm going to show you a few slides to talk a bit about the, the codes that we will be using. All the slides are online, by the way, if you want to open them. Okay, so the main library that you will be using this week is called uh, Task Space Inverse Dynamics. Why Task Space? Well, it's too soon to tell because I haven't talked about Task Space yet. I'm going to talk about Task Space Control uh, after we, we play a bit with the code. So it's a C++ library. You can find it on, on GitHub. This is the address in case you want to check it out and it relies on other libraries for doing linear algebra we use eigen for doing multi-body dynamics computation we use this library called pinocchio it's another well i mean all of these are open source uh, c++ libraries 
and for solving least square pro programs, which I told you are, we actually solve them using a quadratic programming solver. We use this solver here called A quad proc, which is, as far as I know, the, the fastest for this kind of problems. So uh, pros and cons about uh, this library, TSID, which we will be using. The cons is that it's not very mature. Uh, it's, I started writing it in, in February 2017, so it is two years old basically now. And so there are many missing features that you may need for your application. For instance, I haven't implemented yet the joint position limits. I just have the joint acceleration and velocity limits, just to mention one that we, we already saw. And there are other kind of features that people sometimes need and that are not in the library. Those are the cons. Uh, the pros is that it's a very efficient library, so it, it's, been, it's been written for being efficient, so it can be used on, on real system because basically you can compute the whole control loop in less than one millisecond for a humanoid, and the humanoid is kind of the worst case scenario because it's a system with the highest number of degrees of freedom and so the slowest computation time. It has been tested both in simulation and on, on a real system, this robot here, HRP2, which is a humanoid. Well, it's open source, the design is, is modular, so even if there are many missing features, the, the design of the library is basically done for it to be easy to extend. So it's not like, okay, I have a missing feature and I, I need to completely redesign the library to add this feature. No, everything should be easy to, to add. Like for instance, before this class, I added the, the joint torque limits and the joint velocity limits, which weren't there. And it took me very little time to do so. And what's really cool, I think, for uh, education uh, is that it, the library comes with Python bindings not thanks to me, thanks to our students at last who took the time to implement them. Uh, what does it mean, Python bindings? It means that basically even if the library is C++, you can use it from Python. Okay? I don't know if you're familiar with C++ and Python, but if I were you, I'd rather use Python for learning than C++. It makes your life much easier, you don't need to compile, you just run scripts, it's very easy to plot, it's very easy to debug. I think that's enough, right? And another big pro that's not really a pro is that, as far as I know, there are no alternative to, to this software. At least, if you want, if you want the Python bindings, I think this is the only library that I know that comes with Python bindings. There is another library that is similar to this one, uh, but that's only C++ code. So if you wanted to use that you would need to code everything in C++. So especially for the initial phase where you just want to play a bit with the software to get a feeling of how it works, I think having something in Python makes your life much easier. Okay, so of course the library is already installed in the virtual machine. That's the whole point of giving you the virtual machine. <coughs> So let me introduce you a few key concepts of the library so that when, you, when we start looking at the code, you're not completely lost. We have a few ideas already in mind. Uh, one of the key concepts is the concept of a, of a task. A task basically is a control objective. It's something that you would like the robot to do. Uh, the one task that we have seen so far is the joint posture task, so tracking a reference joint trajectory, that's a task. And actually also um, limits, so inequalities, are modeled as tasks. So like the joint velocity limits and the joint torque limits, they are, they, they are also considered tasks inside the library. Then there is this other object inside the library that you will find very soon, is that it's called robot wrapper. It's basically an interface for the robot. It gives you a way to, to compute all the quantities that are related to the robot, such as the mass matrix, the Jacobians, uh, 
the the bias forces so gravity Coriolis centrifugal these are all the quantities that basically are needed to form to formulate the inverse dynamics control problem of course this depends on the robot model which we're going to specify through URDF files how many of you know URDF files okay none uh, it's a standard format for describing basically uh, multi-body systems, robots in particular. It's, it's been really advertised quite a lot by ROS. I guess you know ROS, Robot Operating System. So it's kind of the, the standard worldwide for uh, robot models. So if someone wants, to, wants you to, to play a bit with a robot model, typically it's going to give you one of these URDF files, which is something like an XML file. So it's very simple to read. And inside that you have basically a description of the geometry of the robot and the inertial properties. So masses, center of mass, uh, inertia matrices, the length of the links. Then you have also typically the, the description of the of the appearance of the robot. So meshes for describing how the robot looks like collision, all this kind of stuff. And then there is this class, uh, which is called inverse dynamics formulation. This is kind of the central class of the whole library. And it's a class that basically collects all the tasks and other stuff that we, we will see later. And it translates all the tasks in an optimization problem. Okay. So that's where uh, the magic happens. Not really complicated, but that's a central class. Once you have an optimization problem, then basically your work as a robotician is, is finished because you have an optimization problem. You just need to pass this problem to a solver and the solver gives you the solution. So unless you have a stupid problem, such as an infeasible problem, or a problem that doesn't represent what you really want to do, well, everything should be fine from that point onward. Okay. So this is the class that we will be using. Basically, what, what we will do in the first script is we create a joint poster task to track a reference uh, joint trajectory. We give it to the inverse dynamics formulation, which translates this task into a least square program. Then we have the least square program and we give it to, to a solver. Here I talk about HQP solver, which stands for Hierarchical Quadratic Programming Solver, which is basically a, a more generic version of the least square program. Okay, but for the time being, basically, we will always uh, solve least square programs. It's just that in the software, to be generic, I, I always refer to HQP because it's, it's more generic. So in case one day I want to add new features, such as the, the hierarchical features, which we will talk about later, uh, I can do it without changing the naming of the software. So just a few details before we, we open the script and we start looking at it. Um, the robot wrapper has a couple of uh, interesting functions. Uh, NQ and NV, this is the same notation that I used uh, in the slides last time. NQ is the size of the configuration vector Q. NV is the size of the velocity vector V. So now that we, we use manipulators, those two are the same. Later, for legged robots, they will be different, you remember. So NV is going to be one element smaller than, than Q. Um, well, model gives you reference to the robot model of Pinocchio. That doesn't matter for now. And then you have function inside robot wrapper, such as mass, which gives you the mass matrix. Nonlinear effects is how they call basically the, the bias forces, the H vector in my notation. That's how it's called inside Pinocchio, which is the library I'm using for dynamics. So I kept the same uh, vocabulary. 
So inverse dynamics formulation, that's again the central class of the, of the whole library. One method that we will be using of this class is add motion task. It's the method that we will use to add the, the joint posture task to the inverse dynamics formulation to say, hey, this is a task that I would like to, to perform. So please keep it into account when you're formulating the optimization problem. That's what add motion task me means. And you have to specify the task and other stuff that we, had, we haven't talked about yet uh, for the moment. So let's please neglect them. So once you have added your, your task, you have this method, compute problem data, which takes basically the state of the system. So Q and V, the time, which is not really used, but it's taken. And it gives you as output uh, HQP data, which is basically uh, a representation of an, of an optimization problem, of a least square problem. This is how the HQP data is defined inside, but it's not important right now. And once you have your, your HQP data, you need to solve it. And we have a, an abstract interface for a HQP solver so that if one day we, we get bored of using a quad prog, which is the one we're using right now, we can replace it with something else without changing the code. And each solver has a resize method, which basically tells it how many variables, equality constraints and inequality constraints you're gonna have in the optimization problem. And then you have a solve method that takes uh, a HQP data and gives you a HQP output. So it takes a problem and it gives you the solution. The solution could be also problem is infeasible or problem is unbounded in case you, you, you give the solver a stupid problem to solve. Yeah, so inside the, inside the HQP output, you have a, a status flag, which is telling you whether the, the solver was able or not to solve the problem. And then you have the vector of uh, primal and dual variables. If you don't know what dual variables are, it's not important for, for the application we have in mind. So in terms of available uh, solvers, actually there are, I, I said before that uh, we are using a quad prog for solving quadratic programs, so the square programs. But in practice, there are actually three different versions of a quad prog inside the library. It's not crucial for you to know, but I'm just gonna mention it because you, you may see it in the code. Um, Basically, you have the original a quad prog, which is called as a quad prog, and then you have two new versions, which are a quad prog real time, which is the fastest, and a quad prog fast, which is slower than this but faster than the original one. And the difference is that the real time version needs you to, to specify the size of the problem at compile time. So it can use, basically doesn't need to allocate memory ever. Whereas this version here allows you to, to change the problem size at runtime, but it only allocates memory when you resize the problem, not when you solve it, which wasn't the case for the original solver. So what does it mean in practice? It means that you have these three solvers. These are tests that I ran on the computer of HRP2, which is again a, a very old robot, so it has a very old computer, so that's kind of a worst case scenario. And also I'm, I'm solving the problem for a humanoid, so it's as large as it can get. You have 60 variables, 14 inequalities and 18 equalities. And here you can see minimum, average and maximum computation times expressed in milliseconds. And you can see that the original one is slower than the fast version, which is slightly slower than the real time version. So I think that in the scripts, we will always be using the second one so we can resize it at runtime, but it's faster than the, the original equal prox one. So it's now time to, to start playing with the codes. <coughs> 
you can open the virtual machine, then open a terminal and run these three lines. This is to go to the directory uh, of the TSID library. This is to update because I, I've pushed some code uh, this morning, so you need to update. And then Spider is the editor that I suggest you to use for, uh, for writing Python code. Then once you have opened the editor, you can open this file here, x0, your file, joint space control. And then you can press F5 to, to run the script. You should see a robot manipulator appearing and doing some sinusoidal motion. And then a few plots showing you the joint position, velocities, accelerations. If you don't, then tell me. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to also open the virtual machine and we're going to play a bit with the code together. Can you read this, or can I, should I zoom more? Okay, so you should, all of you should have Spider open or whichever editor you want with this script so that we can take a look at that together. So when you run it, you should see something like this. And then some, some plots. Accelerations, velocities, and Joint angles. So the first time you run it, actually, it's going to ask you a few questions. Could you please go back to the um, lines of code? Where can I find this? Oh, sure. I closed it, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I can I can reopen it. It's in the, in the directory exercises. You have all the scripts that we will be using during the, the course. And the one that we use today is x0. Something. But it's the only one with x0. It's not needed, but it just doesn't block the terminal. So if you go back to the terminal, you can keep typing stuff in, in that. Has everybody opened the file? So one thing, uh, the first time you run it, 
probably you get a window that looks like this okay and in this window you should select execute in a new dedicated python console and also typically i suggest to, to select interact with the python console after execution if you have already done that uh, then you can re basically configure this by going to run configure I don't know if that's the problem that you you were getting, but that was the problem. Okay. X zero. This is a this is a file name. So, any issue with that? No? Okay, so we start taking a look at the code, maybe? So, the code starts with a bunch of import mm -hmm. it's the equivalent of include basically in, in C++ in Python it's called import it's just to include basically external packages uh, you have <coughs> how many of you are familiar with Python okay minority so I'm, I'm gonna give you a few details uh, just to get you acquainted with the language so NumPy is a very important library for Python users. It's basically what gives you the functionalities of linear algebra. So if you want to work with matrices and vectors, typically you use NumPy. If you want to basically solve linear systems, uh, so you have a, a system AX equal B, you want to find a X. Again, for that, NumPy gives you matrix decompositions to, to do that for computing pseudo inverses, all the numerical uh, numerical stuff you can find it in NumPy. So that's what we are using. That's why we are importing a bunch of stuff from NumPy, such as uh, this function here to compute the, the norm of a vector, for instance. Another very important library is matplotlib which is supposed to basically reproduce the same plotting functionality of MATLAB inside Python. That's why it's called matplotlib, the MATLAB plotting library. So that's what we're going to use for doing plots. Well, time is just to measure time. Pinocchio is a library that we use for um, matrix, uh, for dynamics computation, so to compute robot-related quantities. And inside the codes, I don't know why, but there is this convention of uh, calling it SC3. So when you see SC3, it's actually, it actually refers to Pinocchio. TSID is a library that I've just described 10 minutes ago. The Peto Corba server is basically uh, the viewer. So when you see the, that window uh, showing up with the robot moving, that's the viewer which is called Gepetto GUI or Gepetto Viewer. And Gepetto Corba server is the Python interface basically to communicate with the viewer. So in order to tell the viewer, please display this robot, please update the configuration of the robot in this way, then you use the Petrocarbo server. 
And these are details. This is important. Uh, we will always have in all the scripts that we will see uh, a conf file. So we have, I try to separate basically the code and the configuration parameters. So we have an XML file that contains all the configuration parameters that you can modify without touching the file containing the main code. And this file, we always import it as a as conf. So this, this uh, syntax here imports something as something. This is the real file that we are importing. This is the name we give to this file inside this script. So if later on I want to change the, the configuration, what, what I can do is that I can simply copy paste this. <laughs> And I can say import your file conf new as conf, and I don't need to to change anything else inside the script because conf now will be a new configuration file. Okay, we're not doing it in this script, but it's just for good practice of writing code. So, well, I, I, at the beginning, I'm just printing stuff. I have these uh, flags to decide what I want to plot. If you want to plot joint position, joint velocity, joint acceleration, joint torques, if you want to use the viewer or not, you have these flags while well, one is true and zero is false. Then I create a, a robot wrapper. You may remember I mentioned it before. It's this object that gives me access basically to the robots related quantities, mass matrix, bias forces, etc. And you can see that the robot wrapper takes as input the, the URDF file, which is specified in the configuration file. Then once I have my robot wrapper, I create the inverse dynamics formulation and I, I need to pass the robot wrapper to the inverse dynamics formulation object. Then I define the initial state, Q0, V0. Actually, Q0 is defined inside the configuration file. So later we will take a look at the configuration file as well, but it's just basically a file with values of parameters that I chose. It's a Python. It's, all, it's also a Python file, yeah. Uh, one question. Or if you want to inspect uh, some methods, we need to draw uh, if because I don't remember if Spider has some uh, quick helper uh, if you want to inspect. Uh, so Spider maybe has something because here you have object inspector, file explorer. So in some cases, it helps you. Um, you can, of course, look at the C++ code, which is in the same folder. Or you can use also the help function. If you write help, open parentheses, times, and then you, you add uh, the class or the method that you want to have information on. It the typically gives you, uh, yeah, it, it <laughs> prints you something. Like if you do help uh, norm, it gives you the documentation of the norm function here. Uh, I don't know how much it's going to work, however, for the for the Python bindings. So if it's pure Python, no problem. But if it's actually a, a, a fake Python, because it's just a Python interface to a C++ code, I don't know if it can find much documentation. For sure, it can give you information on the signature of the methods. But at least you know how many parameters and of which type you should specify to a method. But apart from that, I don't think it's going to give you much uh, information. So if you really want to see the documentation, you should look at the C++ code or the documentation generated from the C++ code. So the third argument, the false one, uh, we know what is does it mean from the C++ documentation only, not from the... Let, let me try. So, help. 
tsid.robot wrapper so actually there is some documentation <laughs> oh that's that's more than i expected <laughs> there is everything so you can see it here basically init is a constructor it tells you that the first argument well is just an object uh, robot wrapper which is in this case it's, it's a urdf file then it yeah it's the it's the cloud ets ed no i know okay it, it's this one yeah the first one is self yeah so you, self. Should, you should you shouldn't look at it the first one, ignore it in, 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 the, in the constructor because in Python, the first argument of any method is the class itself. You have file name, then you have package dir, and then you have uh, root type. Then, of course, you need to figure out which, uh, which constructor we are calling because you have different kind of constructor. In this case, False. I think it refers to the to the verbos. Yeah, because we are calling this constructor. We have the file name, which is urdf. Mm -hmm. We have the package here, which is a std vect of std string, which is exactly what vector is. We created it here. <coughs> and the, the last one is is verbos. Basically, it's a it's a flag that decides the verbosity level of the object so if you say please be variable it's going to print stuff uh, while you execute uh, and typically you don't want that so we set it to false okay so yeah by using help and the name of the class or the method you, you can have the documentation here which i didn't expect So we have created the robot wrapper, we have created the inverse dynamics formulation. Then we define the initial state Q0 V0. We just take it from the configuration uh, file for the Q0 and we suppose that the robot starts with zero velocities. So we create a, a zero vector of size robot.nv. So you remember nv was the size of the velocity vector. This syntax is a bit annoying, right? Because you have to do np.zeros and then np.matrix. And that's due to the fact that uh, inside NumPy, you have two different ways of representing matrices, basically. Ah, OK. OK, let me give you a brief introduction to that, because that's the number one reason of bugs. One is, in Python is vector, one is a vector that you can. Yeah, so you have np dot matrix and you have np dot array okay so matrix they are um, two-dimensional objects what does it mean it means that if you have a, a matrix uh, m and you want access to an element it's always going to be m i j even if it's a vector, you always have two indexes, okay? And it, it cannot be like a tensor, it cannot have a third dimension. NPRA, instead, you, they are more general, it's an n dimensional object. So it can have one in index, two indexes, three indexes, or how many you want, okay? The main difference between these two is that if you have two matrices uh, A, B, and you write A cross B, then it does what you expect. It multiplies them with matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. With arrays, <laughs> that's not the case. If, with arrays, if you do A cross B, this is element-wise multiplication. If they have the same size. 
Otherwise, it's an error, of course. Yeah. So MP zeros is a vector, one dimensional. So MP zeros, yeah. it gives you an array. array. Yeah. But Pinocchio and the SID, we, we work with matrices. Yeah. So once we generate the array with a code to MP dot zeros, we need to convert it to get a matrix. And then you transpose. And, you, yeah. and I e transpose it yeah. because I need a, a column. Otherwise, I would I would get a row. That's the reason. What did you make this choice to use matrix? I didn't make this choice. I advised uh, the developers of Pinocchio not to do, to make this choice because everybody in the world is using array. But they said no, it's stupid to use array because if I do A cross B, I don't get a matrix multiplication. I say sure, but everybody in the world is using array, <laughs> so we will need them to convert everything when we will interfacing with other solvers or when when we do plotting we need to convert from matrices to arrays every time and it's annoying so they didn't listen to me and now they are going back to array <laughs> after a few years of painful coding oh, okay it's nice when you're you're right but yeah, uh, the problem is that since they took this choice of using matrices and I had them as basically my main de dependency for my library, I also had kind of to follow them in this choice. So now also my library uses matrices and now I will need also to do the conversion back to array. Hopefully this year, I don't know, maybe we have time. So yeah, let's say a bad uh, design choice. So we're going to be using mainly matrices inside the code, but of course when we need to do plots, since everybody but us uses arrays, we need to convert to array. The good news is that if you have your, your matrix M, you just do M dot A, and it gives you the array version of that matrix. Okay, so the conversion is very concise in the code. You don't need to do anything. A or A1 if you want the, the vectorized version of that matrix. Oh. Okay, so that's what we're going to use inside, uh, inside the, the plotting functions. If you want to plot uh, a vector. M, which is actually represented as a matrix, you do plot of M dot A1, so it, it gets converted to an array and then it to plot it. Because otherwise, if you plot it directly as a matrix, we uh, get something that is undefined. Okay, so we have the initial state. <coughs> then, okay, we, 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 we do a first computation of all the problem data just to initialize all the matrices and vectors. And then we have the interesting part where we create the, the joint tracking task, which is called task joint posture inside the library. You give it a name and you, you pass a reference to the robot wrapper. Then you set the feedback gains, KP and KG. They are specified inside the configuration file uh, as, as scalar, so we need to multiply them times uh, matrices. No, times vectors, because the gain, gains are basically vectors because we suppose that the game matrix is diagonal, so we just give the, the diagonal values. We use uh, the old trick of setting the derivative gain as two, two times the square root of the proportional gain. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you, set the if you have a, a second order system and you set the derivative gain as two times square root of the proportional gain, you get a critically dumped system. So the system is going to convert to the reference without overshooting, so no oscillations, 
and as fast as possible. So it's not going to be under overdumped. Okay, that's a, an old trick. Then once we have the, the posture task, we just add it to the formulation so that it's going to be included inside the optimization problem. Add motion task. We have this other uh, parameter that we haven't talked about, uh, weight priorities, but we're going to talk about them in the next hour. And then we create uh, a trajectory for the basically joint to follow because we said when we do joint space control, we need a reference joint space trajectory to follow. So we create it and we set, uh, actually we create a trajectory that is constant. It's called trajectory Euclidean uh, constant. So it's not really a trajectory. I mean, it's, it's a trajectory that just stays at, at the initial value forever. Mm -hmm. But that, those are actually the only trajectories that are implemented inside the library. So I'm going to show you right in a moment how do we get a trajectory that, that actually moves. We set it as a reference for the postural task. So what is the, the trajectory for? So, so it's a list of position. What is, uh, so when you set the... Yeah, trajectory Euclidean constant. Yes. What, what is the object of trajectory posture? So the trajectory posture, yeah. Trajectory posture is a, is a, a list a... of position in time. No. No. No, mm, not really. It's an object that you can, to, to which you can ask the, the next, the, the next uh, reference value for the trajectory. Basically, and the, are, um, I would say, is... Uh, it's typically an iterative computation yeah, inside. Okay. You, do, you, don't, you never store the complete trajectory. Okay. You typically have a, like a, a method to compute the next, next value. Step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so which is the step in time? That's defined by you in general. Okay. I mean, for this one, since it's constant, you don't need to know the yeah, step in time. If you have like a sinusoidal, trajectory generator then typically it takes the step in time as an input value okay. so you update uh, every time the trajectory posture and compute update that's how you, we are going to do it yeah you you anticipated me <coughs> so here we have the the velocity limits which we take from the model and we multiply times a, a scaling factor that's defined in the in the configuration file let's say to be a bit more conservative we don't want to reach exactly the, the limits we want to stay a bit below so we scale it down a little bit and then we create the the optimization solver which is as i said before the the fast version not the real-time version, so that, so that we can resize it online without any issue. So we create it and we resize it to exactly the number of variable equality and inequality constraints that are given to us by the, by the formulation objects. Okay, then we have a bunch of stuff to do if, to, to create the viewer and initialize it. It's not really interesting inside this if use viewer then we create uh, basically we allocate memory for storing different trajectories joint torques joint positions joint velocities accelerations reference position velocity accelerations desired accelerations so i don't know if you remember my my notation the desired accelerations are the reference acceleration plus the pd feedback terms okay mm. okay and then here we define uh, amplitude phase and frequency of the joint space sinusoids that we are going to track in the script so the motion that, that you, you see when you run the script is basically the robot trying to track some sinusoids in joint space 
and the parameters of the sinusoid are defined in these three lines here. So by playing with these values, you can modify the motions that you're going to get when running the script. So in particular, I set to zero uh, everything for the last three joints, and I'm only using focusing on, on the first three, which are the, basically the shoulder joints. I just set some almost random values just to get some motion out of it. It's not really anything meaningful. And then we basically start the control loop. So we have a, a for loop from 0 to n, where n is the number of time steps that we want to simulate. That's defined again in the configuration file, so you can make the simulation longer or shorter just by changing that value. And at each loop, well, we, we measure the time. This is just to make sure that the, the loop is, is running in real time, so that if you are faster than real time, at the end we're gonna sleep for a while to get uh, the viewer to show us the motion in real time, not, not faster. We compute the reference trajectory. This is just amplitude times uh, sinusoid of the frequency plus the phase and the derivative. And since I'm using, um, here I'm using, I'm using matrices, but what I wanna do here is element-wise multiplications. Mm -hmm. So I cannot use the, just the, the times uh, symbol. In the opposite, if you have an array and you want to make a... Element-wise multiplication? No, the yeah, the opposite. If you have an array, but you want to create... Uh, you do perform, uh, multiply. Perform. You have to do a the dot. I think ah. it's called mult or multiply. Okay. Or okay. the dot. Dot. No. Dot. No. no. It's a function of. No. It's a function of a. It's a function of a. Is the mult. Yeah. Because you never use this. Because no, I do use this. It's just it's a, uh, right now I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. So mp dot product. It's gonna be either prod or product. It's a G of D. Dot product. The dot product is dot product. Yeah. But this is the way you detect it with the arrays. Oh, okay. Or what or not? Returns the products of array elements over a given axis. Yeah, I think that's it. I think it's prod. Okay. So not so not mult not mult. Mult is for element wise. If you have matrices, this is prod. Luckily, NumPy is a very well documented library, yeah, so you don't need to rely on me. There is also a um, file with uh, a page with MATLAB against NumPy. So yeah, if so if, if, if you know MATLAB, like, you can see how the same things are done with, with NumPy. Yeah. So we compute the reference trajectory, Q, V, and DV. We set these values to the well, to the reference trajectory, which we call sample posture, and we set we basically give it to the postural task as a reference. Then we 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 call the, the method compute problem data, which I mentioned before. You remember in the slides to compute basically the optimization problem that I need to solve to get my control torques. And once I have my problem, which is HQP data, I just give it to the solver, which gives me the solution. I check whether the solution status is different from zero. So zero means optimal, solved. If it's different from zero, it means it could not be solved and I print the error code. So this is gonna happen if you give the solver an infeasible problem. So assuming that everything went fine, 
Uh, here I, I retrieve the actuation forces, so the joint torques, and the accelerations, so dv. I also get the desired acceleration from the postural task, so these are the reference plus the PD uh, feedback terms. Then here I do some prints every uh, once in a while. And here I do the numerical integration, which may seem a bit convoluted, but actually what I'm doing is, is really simple. What I'm really doing is that I'm, for the case of a manipulator, what I'm doing is really this. Okay. I'm just assuming constant acceleration for one time step and for updating the velocity I'm just mm -hmm. doing q dot plus dt This is true inside the, the, the simulator? The this is how typically simulator... I mean, that's the simplest yeah, integration yeah. scheme ever that's called uh, Euler Euler uh, explicit, explicit. Uh, integration. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm writing it down in that a bit convoluted way by computing first v mean and then uh, updating v and finally updating q with, with v mean is that when it would be the case of a leg robot, since Q and V don't have the same size, I can no longer do uh -huh. this, right? Because this vector and this vector don't have the same size okay. for a leg robot. So I cannot just sum them sum. together. That's why I need to use the, the method integrate provided by Pinocchio, because mm -hmm. that provides the integration using the algebra tricks. Okay, so okay, matrix exponential. And so that, that, yeah, yeah. That, that thing there is equivalent to this for the manipulator because we are working in a Euclidean space, but it, it, it generalizes also to the Lie group case. Okay, but you should think of that as doing this because mathematically it's equivalent. So I integrate. And I increase uh, the time. I update the, the configuration of the robot in the viewer. I don't do it every time step because it would be too fast anyway for your eyes to see it. So I do it like every, I don't know, 50 milliseconds, something like that. And then at the end, I measure the time. And if the time spent is less than the time, than the DT of the controller, I do a slip to get a, a real time evolution of the viewer. And at the end, I just have some, some plots. So I plot the positions, I plot the joint velocities with their mean and max values, and I plot the accelerations. So of course, if you're not familiar with Python, all of this code is gonna look a bit cryptical, but hopefully you, if you're interested, you can take the time to look at it later. Uh, and if you're not, it doesn't matter. I mean, you don't really need for the scope of this class. The point now is to be enough familiar with the code so that you can modify it a little bit, change a few parameters, especially change the values of certain parameters, rerun, take a look at the plots and the motion of the robot in the viewer and reason about what you see. Okay, so that's basically what uh, we, should, we should do. Uh, I just noticed that actually it's a bit late, so let's take a break right now and then we, we do it after the break. Yeah? yeah. Okay, I come during the break, okay? Everybody can take a break in the meanwhile.